We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm -hmm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Now, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the darkened hour. Welcome to another episode of the darkened hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. In this episode, we will be covering the historical timeline of what happened in the days before, during, and after the hijacking of United Airlines Flight 93. Unfortunately, this particular incident has been foretold by the federal government, who used the FBI to investigate the matter without managing to tell the public the actual anomalies that took place. And by responsible, irresponsible fringe conspiracy theorists, who allow the irrational ideas of profiteers and outright frauds to eludicate a narrative which often defy reason. Today, we will cover the operators involved with the hijacking and the intelligence agencies who are managing the case and the foreign and domestic intelligence units who are monitoring the operators without the knowledge of the federal government. On August 30th, 2001, Ziad Jara accesses his email account at UA.com. While there, he would book a reservation for United Airlines Flight 93 while using a Visa card, 401-180-607-080-4835. The cost of the first class ticket was $1,621.50. His seat, 1B, was an aisle seat. His purpose was to allow the muscle hijackers to incapacitate the crew and to deter the passengers from revolting. Just a day earlier, he had obtained a Virginia state identification card at the DMV in Springfield, Maryland. His next stop, Florida. Ziad would board a plane from Baltimore, Maryland to Miami, Florida. When he landed, Jara traveled to Lauderdale by the sea, a town in Broward County, where he terminated his former residence located at 4641 Borgenale Drive. Afterwards, Jara took out $100 from an ATM. He would meet up with Ahmed Al Haznawi, part of the hijacking team of Flight 93. Both men rented rooms at the Mona Lisa Apartments located in Celebration, Florida, about 225 miles from Broward County. The men would reside together till September 7th. It was the only time Zia Jara ever lived for a period with the hijacking team or Hamburg cell. Jara had always lived separately from them. Al Haznawi had applied for a US visa at the Jeddah Consular Office in Saudi Arabia. Head of the American Visa Bureau at the office had reviewed Al Haznawi's application, which would be J. Michael Springman. Al Haznawi had presented a suspicious passport, which allegedly had fraudulent travel stamps. This type of deception was used previously by Al Qaeda during the late 1990s during the Millennium Plot. According to a 9-11 staff monograph, quote, Al Haznawi listed his occupation as student, but left blank the line of which he was asked to supply the street address of his present school, end quote. 
Much like many of the operatives involved with the 9-11 plot, he was not interviewed. His application was put on hold, however, by Springman. The other two hijackers of Flight 93, Saeed al-Ghamdi and Ahmed al-Nami, had also applied for their visas just a few months later. On April 23, 2001, al-Nami had applied at the same JEDA office as, as, as al-Haznawi. He received a B-1, B-2 tourist business visa in JEDA with his new passport. The passport al-Nami used was legitimate. It was a Saudi passport for which he received just two days earlier. His passport number, number C505363, was given to him without any problems. According to the Saudi consular office in Riyadh, al-Nami had been approved of a new passport, quote, because there was evidence of travel to Afghanistan in his previous one, end quote. There were some questions about why the Saudis didn't brief al-Nami's travel to Afghanistan, a known destination for young jihadis. But the 9-11 Commission travel report states, quote, Nami's action could have raised questions had it been coupled with the fact that he was applying with a new passport. But it would not have been noticed by the consular office who issued the visa because Saudis were not required to fill in their applications fully. Saudis were rarely interviewed and state's name check system did not automatically call up prior visa insurances. It called up only prior refusals, end quote. Just a few short months later, Saeed al-Ghamdi would also apply for his U.S. visa. On June 21, 2001, al-Ghamdi acquired a second two-year B-1, B-2 business tourist passport visa in Jeddah. His application was also suspended by Springman, for his application was incomplete and he was not interviewed. Al-Ghamdi's visa application indicated they had never applied for a U.S. visa before. A curious similarity to Nami's al application. Just like Al-Haznawi, Al-Nami, and Al-Ghamdi, Springman saw an alarming trend happening. Young Saudis who were not interviewed gave incomplete visa applications in just 12 months' time. Springman complained to his superiors at the Department of Foreign Affairs that his suspensions on these applications were lifted by Shania Steiger, who had been the consular officer in Jeddah and issued 11 visas to people who were participants in the September 11th attacks, including the three applications belonging to the Flight 93 hijackers. In an interview conducted by Guns and Butter, Bonnie Faulkner, on February 2nd, 2016, Springman tells Faulkner about the visa process. Quote, with a visa application, you've got to establish some kind of connection to the place of application on your own country. You have a job. You're going to school. You're running a business. You have an investment. Whatever that's going to be strong enough to bring you back from the United States for whatever reason you're going here. For example, People go for tourism, to visit relatives, to sign a contract with a business in the United States, whatever. Then they can't stay here. They have to go back to managing their own business. They have to graduate from their university. They have to manage their job. They're either a manager in a company, and they can't go away and leave it. None of these people had any of those ties. They were people that couldn't name the city they were going to, couldn't tell me why they were going there, had absolutely no information available to me as to what they were doing or why they were going, end quote. On September 5th, evening hour, Jara and Al-Haznawi both paid cash to purchase two one-way tickets to Newark Airport. They purchased these tickets at the Freestyle Cruise and Travel Agency in Fort Lauderdale while Al Ahmed Al-Nami and Saeed Al-Ghamdi had purchased tickets for a September 7th flight to Newark at the Mile High Travel on Commercial Boulevard, paying cash for their tickets. The four men then flew on Spirit Flight 1500 and landed at Newark International Airport on September 7th, 2001, 
after staying at a nearby motel in Fort Lauderdale the day prior. However, there are differing chronologies regarding the departure times of Al Nami and Al Gamdi. From History Commons, quote, according to an in initial FBI chronology, Jara and Al Gamdi booked tickets on Continental Flight 1500 on September 5th, but the chronology gives the wrong times. Departure at 8.35 p.m. and arrival at 11.20 p.m. for this flight, which, according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, actually leaves just midday. The chronology also refers to this flight as Spirit Airlines Flight 1500 and not 1700. Chronologies for Jara and al Hasnawi submitted at the 2006 trial of Zacharias Musali will say that they purchased tickets for Spirit Air Flight 1500. However, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics have the Continental Flight as 1700. However, it is, end quote, by the way. However, it is clear all four men did board Spirit Flight 1500 and landed at Newark. While in Newark, Jara had rented a Mitsubishi Galant at the budget car service at the Newark airport. He paid cash for this service. Jara then walked to the Marriott located in the airport where he would rent two rooms, rooms 466 and rooms 468. Jara stood by himself in room 466. Al Hasnawi, Al Nami, and Al Gamdi would stay in 468. Jara would drive them for an unexplained visit to Maryland, where he would receive a speeding ticket from Maryland State Trooper Joseph Catalano. Jara had been speeding down Interstate 95 up to 90 miles per hour. Catalano issued a speeding ticket and allowed Jara to leave while checking his background information. Later, Bob Graham, the co-chair of the Joint House Inquiry into the September 11th attacks, would mention that had the United Arab Emirates investigated further into Jarrah's stop over from Afghanistan in 2000 and saw that his passport, along with his reading material, which was terrorist-related, and put him on a terrorist watch list, the state trooper would have held him in detention, hence stop, stopping Jarrah from participating in the 9-11 attacks. On September 6th, Jara, just a day prior, Jara would call his mother, Nafisa, with his father, Samir, in the background in the home in Becca Valley, Lebanon. Jara told him he intended to see them on September 22nd for his cousin's wedding and thanked them for sending him money. He then told them he loved them and hung up. It was the last time his family heard from their son. During the afternoon of September 9th, Jara would check out of the Marriott and relocate to the Days Inn Hotel, also located by Newark Airport. Jara again would pay for two separate rooms, paying $36.89 for each adult in the two rooms. Jara rented room 725 for himself, while the other three would sleep in room 2727. The next day, Jara and Ahmed Al Nami would head over to Kinko's in Springfield, New Jersey. At 3.04 p.m., Jara would use Al Nami's credit card to rent a computer while there. It cost $22.15 for 58 minutes. It is suspected by the FBI that Jara had made final email correspondence with Ramzi bin al Sheib, who was in Germany, acting as a conduit officer for Al-Qaeda. Jara spent his final evening writing a letter to his girlfriend, Azel Sanguin, with whom he made a marriage plan a year prior. This letter is widely interpreted as a suicide note. The letter did not reach Sanguin. She had entered witness protection shortly after the attacks, and her apartment was unattended. The letter was returned to the United States by the Postal Services, where it was discovered and delivered to the FBI due in part to a misspelling of Seguin's address. The letter was indeed quite cryptic. Quote, first of all, I want, to, I want you to know and be sure that I love you with all my heart. You must not doubt my love for you. I love you, and I will love you forever, Habibi. 
Hayatim, Askim, Ganim, Albi, Iret, Habibi. I do not want you to be sad. I am still alive somewhere where you cannot hear me, see me, but I will see you and know how you are doing. I will wait for you until you come to me. There comes a time for everyone to make a move. It is my fault that I gave you so many hopes about marriage, wedding, children, family, and many other things. I am what you wish for, but unfortunately, you must wait a little bit until we will be together again. I did not flee from you, but did what I was supposed to do. You ought to be very proud because it is an honor and you will see the results and everybody will be happy. I want you to stay as strong as I know you can be. Do what you meant to do. Keep your head up, but with a goal, never without a goal. You must always have a goal. Always think what for, why. Always remember what and what you are. Stay strong. Winners always carry their heads up high. Hold on to what you have until we meet again. And then we will have a wonderful eternal life without any problems and sadness in palaces of gold and silver and so much more. I did not leave you on your own. Allah is with you and your parents. Whenever you need anything, ask him. He listens and knows what is inside you. Think about what you are and who deserves you. I am taking you into my arms and kiss your hands and your head. I thank you and apologize for the wonderful, difficult five years that you have spent with me. Your, praise, your patience will be rewarded. The Janet, inshallah. I am your prince and I will come for you. End quote. September 11th, 2001. Zia Jara, Ahmed Al Hasnawi, Ahmed Al Nami, and Saeed Al Gandhi would check out of the Days Inn Hotel. All four of the men would then enter Newark Airport at different times as to not attract attention among the security at the screening area. According to the FBI, Jara phones his girlfriend from Days Inn, but the 9 11 Commission report states that the call came from Newark International Airport. Azel Sanguine would recount that she was at the doctor's office and receives a call from Jara about an hour before he lands Flight 93. Sanguine will later recount, quote, he was very brief. He said he loved me three times. I asked what was up. He hung up shortly afterwards. It was so short and rather strange him saying that repeatedly. End quote. At 7.03 a.m., Saeed Al Gandhi checked in without any luggage, while Ahmed Al Nami checked in two bags. At 7.24 a.m., Ahmed Al Hasnawi checked in one bag, and at 7.39 a.m., Ziar Jara checked in without any luggage. Only Ahmed Al Hasnawi is selected for additional security by airport security under the FAA's CAPS program. None of the suspected hijackers came under any suspicion from security. There is also no security video of the hijackers taken at the airport. The only consequence is that his checked bag is screened for explosives and not loaded onto the plane until it is confirmed that he had boarded. Al Hasnawi and Al Gandhi boarded the aircraft at 7.39 a.m. and sat in first class seats 6B and 3D respectively. Al Nami boarded one minute later and sat in first class seat 3C. Jara allegedly boarded at 7.48 a.m. and sat in seat 1B. All of the screeners on duty at the checkpoint are sub subsequently interviewed by the FBI and none report anything unusual or suspicious having occurred during the screening process of all four men. At 8.01 a.m., Flight 93 is delayed for 41 minutes on the runway at Newark Airport. The flight was to wait in line at about a dozen planes before it could take off. At 8.42 a.m., Newark Tower clears United Airlines Flight 93 for takeoff from gate A-17. It took off at 8.46 a.m. 
Lieutenant Colonel William Glover, the commander of NORAD's Air Warning Center, will later recall that after 9.03 a.m., when the second plane hit the World Trade Center, those in the operations center are starting to receive reports that they have hijackings coming in. He will say, quote, we had all these other reports coming in now. We were receiving from the FAA that there's other issues on there, end quote. At 9.04 a.m., Ed Bollinger, the United Airlines dispatcher, sent out an ACARS, which is an acronym for Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System, to several United flights indicating that aircraft had crashed into the World Trade Center. However, these messages did not provide details. As Bollinger was responsible for multiple flights, he did not send the message to Flight 93 until 9.23 a.m. At 9.24 a.m., Flight 93 received Ballinger's ACARS warning, quote, beware any cockpit intrusion. Two AC aircraft hit World Trade Center, end quote. At 9.26 a.m., Captain Jason Dahl sent an ACARS message back, quote, Ed, confirm latest message, please, Jason, end quote. At 9.27 a.m., the flight crew responded to routine radio traffic from air traffic control. This was the last communication made by the flight crew before the hijacking. At 9.28 a.m., Flight 93 was presumably hijacked. First Officer Leroy Homer managed to transmit to the ground shouting, Mayday, Mayday, get out, which was heard over the radio. 35 seconds after the first Mayday call, the crew made another transmission. Homo shouted, Mayday, Mayday, get out of here, Mayday, get out of here. The hijackers assaulted the cockpit and moved the passengers to the rear of the plane at the same time to minimize any chance of either the crew or the passengers interfering with the attack. At Langley Air Force Base, a klaxon horn will sound, notifying the pilots of the scramble order, and they will be airborne by 9.30 a.m. According to journalist and author Jer Lungman, quote, on all phone calls made from Flight 93, passengers reported seeing only three hijackers. Not a single caller reported four hijackers, end quote. The cockpit voice recorder began recording the final 30 minutes of Flight 93 at 9.31 a.m. A voice allegedly belonging to Zia Jara announced to the cabin, Ladies and gentlemen, hear the captain. Please sit down. Keep remaining seating. We have a bomb on board, so sit. The cockpit recording captured Dahl moaning and Jara allegedly telling him in English to sit down and to stop touching something presumably the controls. Jason Dahl's wife, Sandy Dahl, listening to the cockpit voice recorder, determined that the pilot, quote, was fussing at my husband. He was speaking in English, and he spoke Arabic anytime he was talking with the other hijackers. Jason made moaning sounds after that. It sounded like he was trying to mess with stuff or get up because the hijacker pilot kept telling him to stop and to sit down, end quote. Unable to engage the autopilot, Jara allegedly turned the plane and headed back to 9.35 a.m. At 9.39 a.m., Jara allegedly would again broadcast to the cabin, here's the captain. I would like to tell you all to remain seated. We have a bomb on board, and we are going back to the airport, and we have our demands, so please remain quiet. Passengers and crew began making phone calls to officials and family members starting at 9.30 a.m. using GTE airphones and mobile phones. Altogether, the passengers and crew made 35 airphone calls and two cell phone calls from the flight. Tom Burnett made several phone calls to his wife beginning at 9.30 a.m. During one of Burnett's calls, his wife informed him of the attacks on the World Trade Center, and he replied that the hijackers were talking about crashing this plane. Oh, my God, it's a suicide mission. According to Dina Burnett, Tom continues, quote, yes, yes, just listen. Our airplane has been hijacked. It's United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco. We are in the air. The hijackers have already knifed the guy. One of them has a gun. They're telling us there's a bomb on board. Please call the authorities, end quote. 
Cleveland flight controller Stacy Taylor had been warned to watch transcontinental flights heading west for anything suspicious. She later recalls, quote, I hear one of the controllers behind me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And he starts yelling for the supervisor. He goes, what is this plane doing? What is this plane doing? I wasn't that busy at the time. And I pulled it up on my screen. And he was climbing and descending and climbing and descending. But very gradually, he'd go up 300 feet. He'd go down 300 feet. And it turned out to be United 93, end quote. Mark Bingham called his mother, Alice Hoagland. He reported that the plane had been hijacked by three men who claimed to have a bomb. Jeremy Glick called his wife at 9.37 a.m. From, from row 27 and told her the flight was hijacked by three dark-skinned men who looked Iranian, wearing red bandanas and wielding knives. Todd Beamer attempted to call his wife from row 32 at 9.43 a.m., but was rerouted to GTE phone operator Lisa Jefferson. Beamer told the operator that the flight was hijacked by three people and that two people who he thought were the pilots on the floor dead or dying. He said one of the hijackers had a red belt with what looked to be a bomb strapped to his waist. Flight attendant C.C. Lyles called her husband at 9.47 a.m., and left him a message saying the plane had been hijacked by three hijackers. Numerous calls will repeat the same. Three hijackers only. Phone calls made from cell phones aboard flights were not at all improbable back in 2001. John Sheehan, Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics, once headed a study of cell phone use. Quote, the airlines are misleading the traveling public says John Sheeran, who headed the RTCA study, there is no real connection between cell phone frequencies and the frequencies of the navigation or communication systems, end quote. In an article from the San Francisco Gate in July of 2001, also noted cell phone use on airplanes, also worked for long duration periods, including a flight attendant's own personal experience with flyers on their cell phone use, as outlined in the published article. Quote, Despite government regulations, or perhaps because of it, chatting above the clouds on a cell phone has proved irresistible for some. I've seen passengers hunkered in their seats, whispering into Nokia's. I've watched frequent flyers scurry from a carry-on as muffed ringing emanates from within. Once, after the lavatory line grew to an unreasonable length, I knocked on the door. A guilt-ridden teenager emerged. She admitted that she'd been in there for half an hour, talking to her boyfriend on a cell phone, end quote. Plus, in their overall findings in the Federal Aviation Administration, they found cell phones can work in flight, but that direction of the airline carrier's ability to maintain connection with towers on board and on the ground. Quote, these aviation's authorities reported that use of cell phones on aircraft while airborne is restricted by telecommunications authority regulations. Operators of aircraft with onboard cellular telephone base stations must have approval from telecommunication authorities before these systems can be used by passengers with their cell phones, end quote. There would be confusion of whether Jara was even seen at all by anyone on board the plane, as nobody ever seemed to depict a very light skinned with bright green eyes had entered their line of vision. Yet the FBI and the 9-11 Commission would state that he was at the pilot seat from the beginning of the hijacking till the crash. However, this is highly suspect. Six phone calls made from Flight 93 would all state that there were only three hijackers. Two included flight attendants, with two in the cabin and one outside the door wearing a suspected bomb belt, which was assuredly fake. It was the only flight which had a hijacker wear a bomb belt. Was this to make up for the lack of personnel? Sandra Bradshaw, a flight attendant aboard 93, would call the speed dial fix number at the United Airlines maintenance facility in San Francisco and spoke for five minutes and 53 seconds. Her call was first answered by a United maintenance employee and was subsequently taken over by the manager at the facility. The manager described the flight attendant as shockingly calm. However, this wasn't at all unusual. Flight attendants are trained to use common sense and to use cooperation in the interests of safety. 
trainees are made aware of the fact that male hijackers may relate more easily to female crew members and are alerted to the natural bond of gratitude captors tend to feel toward hijackers who have control over them. Bradshaw would make another call, this time to Phil Bradshaw. Her husband, Phil, was a U.S. Airways pilot and had picked up the line. Sandra relayed the message to which he told the FBI investigators later in the afternoon about the nature of what the call entailed. Quote, Sandra asked Phil if he had, if he had seen what happened today. Phil told Sandra that two planes had crashed into the World Trade Center in New York City. Sandra then told Phil that a plane had been hijacked. She continued to state that the plane had been hijacked by three men with dark skin. And Sandra stated that they almost looked Islamic. One of the hijackers was seated in first class, and Sandra actually looked at him. This hijacker was a little short guy. The other hijackers were seated in the back of the plane. Sandra only saw the hijackers carrying knives as weapons. All three of the hijackers put red bandanas on their heads as they were hijacking the plane. Additionally, Sandra did not know the location of the plane, but she thought that the plane might be around the Mississippi River because they had just passed over a river. Sandra told Phil that the passengers were getting hot water out of the galley and they were going to rush the hijackers. At the end of the telephone call, Sandra told Phil that everyone was running up to first class and she hung up the telephone, end quote. The passenger revolt on Flight 93 began at 9.57 a.m. after the passengers took a vote among themselves about whether to act. The cockpit voice recorder captured the sounds of crashing, screaming, and the shattering of plates and glass. At 10.01 a.m., a voice is heard telling whomever is piloting the plane, no mention of Ziajar was ever heard from the cockpit voice recorder, which was played for the families during the 2006 Zacharias Misawi trial. Heard her, quote, up down, Saeed, up down, end quote. At 10.01 a.m., Bill Wright is piloting a small plane when an air traffic controller asks him to look around outside his window. Wright sees a commercial aircraft three miles away, close enough that he could see the United Airlines colors. The plane was noticeably jerking its position from side to side. This was to throw off the passengers trying to ram a food cart into the cockpit door to gain entry. The last piece of flight data was recorded at 10.03 a.m. At 10.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93 crashes into a field near a reclaimed coal strip mine known as the Diamond T Mine, once owned by PBS Coals in Stoney's Creek Township in Somerset County. The residents of Somerset County would recall the horror, which unfolded before them. Kelly Levernite, a local resident, was watching news of the attacks when she heard the plane. Quote, I heard the plane going over, and I went out the front door, and I saw the plane going down. It was headed toward the school, which panicked me, because all three of my kids were there. Then you heard the explosion, and felt the blast, and saw the fire and smoke. End quote. Eric Peterson looked up when he heard the plane. Quote, it was low enough. I thought you could probably count the rivets. You could see more of the roof of the plane than you could see the belly. It was on its side. There was a, ma uh, there was a great explosion, and you could see the flames. It was a massive, massive explosion. Flames, and then smoke, and then a massive, massive mushroom cloud. End quote. Val McClatchy had been watching footage of the attacks when she heard the plane. She saw it briefly, then heard the impact. The crash knocked out the electricity and phones. McClatchy grabbed her camera and took the only known picture of the smoke cloud from the explosion. Rodney Peterson and Brandon Leventree noticed a passenger jet lumbering through the sky at about 2,000 feet. They realized such a big plane flying so low in that area is odd. They could see the plane dip its wings sharply to the left, then to the right. The wings level off, and the plane keeps flying south, continuing to descend slowly. Paula Pluta, a resident of Stoney's Creek Township, Pennsylvania, sees Flight 93 crashing behind some trees about 1,500 yards from her home, and then she calls 911, becoming the first person to call the emergency services to report the crash. Terry Butler at Storystown said, quote, it was like moving 
like you wouldn't believe. Next thing I knew, it makes a heck of a sharp right-hand turn, end quote. Charles Sturtz, a half mile away from the crash site, quote, it was really roaring, you know, like it was trying to go someplace, I guess, end quote. Flight 93 fragmented violently upon impact. The debris field was visually spotted by investigators to be about a half a, a mile and a half long. The aircraft had impacted into the ground at 563 miles per hour, according to the National Transportation Safety Board data reading outlet. Most of the aircraft wreckage was found near the impact crater, and numerous first responders arrived on the scene in less than 10 minutes' time, including Shanksville Fire Department, Central City Fire Department, Stoystown Fire Department, Hoobersville Fire Department, Listy Fire Department, Somerset Fire Department, Freedon's Fire Department, and White Oak CMS, along with the FBI and FEMA. Investigators began to trawl the area looking for anything belonging to the aircraft. The FBI had been given control of the site as this was a crime scene that involved a hijacking, a federal crime known as air piracy. The NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, would relinquish control of the site to them because they knew what had happened. The plane was hijacked and crashed into the ground. There would be no need to put the pieces of the plane together since most of it was in very small fragmented pieces due to the plane nosediving into the ground at such a high rate of speed. The impact had left the crater eight to 10 feet deep and about 30 to 50 feet wide. Investigators also found very light debris, including paper and nylon, scattered up to eight miles near New Baltimore, as Flight 93 was also carrying 2,858 pounds of U.S. mail. On September 13th, they would locate the flight data recorder, and on September 14th, they would locate the cockpit voice recorder. Personal effects of the hijackers were found at the crash site, which included a Saudi Arabian ID card of Ahmed El Nami, a Saudi Arabian Youth Hostile Association card of Ahmed El Nami, two passport-sized photographs of Ahmed El Nami, a charged section of Zia Jara's passport, Saeed El Gamdi's Saudi Arabian passport, and part of Ahmed El Nami's Florida driver's license. Wally Miller, the Somerset County mortuary uh, coroner, um, his team had managed to locate human remains within the first few hours of the impact. One of the first identifiable remains belonged to two passengers from a report of the Old Post Gazette, quote, the families of college student Toshia Kugi of Tokyo and computer specialist Waleska Martinez of Jersey City, New Jersey, already have claimed some of their remains. Miller said Martinez's family took possession of her remains within weeks of the crash. She was one of the first victims identified, and Coogee's did the same thing before Thanksgiving, end quote. Somerset County Coroner Wally Miller set up a temporary morgue in the local armory. The Disaster Mortuary Operations Response Team, the Somerset County Hospital, the Pennsylvania Dental Association, and the Pennsylvania State Police assisted in the recovery and identification of any human remains. Approximately 600 pounds were recovered, with only a small piece of backbone being the largest piece recovered. Miller would later find and properly identify 1,500 pieces of human remains. The remains were so fragmented that investigators could not determine whether any victims were dead before the plane crash. Death certificates of the 40 victims listed the cause of death as homicide and listed the cause of death for the Hawaii hijackers as suicide. The remains and personal effects of the victims were returned to the families. All the people on board the flight were identified by December 21st, 2001. The four hijackers were not identified due to the fact that there was no DA samples taken from the, from the hijackers' families. During the late afternoon hours, FBI investigators would search the Days Inn hotel room in Newark, New Jersey. Investigators would used would would find used plane tickets for a Saeed Al Gamdi, Ahmed Al Hasnawi, Zia Jara, and Ahmed Al Hasnawi. The tickets are all from a Spirit uh, Continental Airlines 
flight from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to Newark on um, September 7th. Also, flight manuals for Boeing 757 and 767 airplanes are found in English and Arabic. German authorities from the uh, uh, Federal Office of the Protection of the Constitution, or the LFV, knew quite well who Ziad Jara was and what he wasn't. KFV, uh, the, the, the KFV, uh, not the LFV, the KFV, the KFV investigated New Jara while he lived in Hamburg. There is also conflicting accounts that he had begun monitoring him since his arrival in Greasewald in 1996, along with his cousin, Salim Jara. They begin to assist the FBI in their pent bomb investigation into the September 11th attacks, sending reports about the Hamburg cell and the contacts inside the Al-Quds Mosque. Also found in the crash field were numerous personal effects of the passengers aboard Flight 93, ID cards, keys, even a wedding ring, including flight attendant C.C. Lyle's ID card, passenger Andrew Garcia's wedding ring, passenger Richard Beatrice credentials and badge from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, flight attendant Lorraine Bay's United Airlines badge and airline corkscrew. However, one of the more intriguing artifacts found at the crash site was a business card that was found amongst the steaming wreckage of United Airlines Flight 93. It belonged to Asim Jara, Zia Jara's cousin. On the back of the card were some handwritten notes. The notes include an address in Germany linked with Ramzi bin al Sheib, a member of the hijacker cell in Hamburg. The address was located in Wilmsburg at a red brick pre wow housing project where Muhammad Atta and Marwan al Shehi also lived. Asam Jara had some past history which would illuminate a much deeper aspect of the September 11th attacks. And yet he is relatively unknown to even most investigators. Asim Haljara had a history of being a covert intelligence spy for Libya, Iraq, and Germany, as well as Israel, a claim he continually denies. He is also the only family member who implies that Zia Jara was well involved in the hijacking of Flight 93. But there was also another relative with a link to foreign intelligence and who had a very infamous past. Ali Al-Jara, the first cousin of Zia Jara, had been a Lebanese teacher for many years. That is until July of 2008, when he was subsequently arrested by Hezbollah for being a longtime spy for Israel. Ali Al-Jara had been investigated, and during their findings, they saw that he had been paid well over $100,000 cash for spying on Hezbollah. Ali's brother, Yusuf Al-Jara, is also to have alleged to help them spy but there are a few details about his involvement. Ali al-Jara is said to have belonged to Ahmed Jabril's popular front for the liberation of Palestine general command. The outfit many Arabs, though not the Scottish courts, believe set off the bomb on the TWA flight over Lockerbie in 1988. However, his connections to Syrian intelligence, also investigated by the Lebanese military courts, according to Syrian Mukbarat, the same agency that involved itself into Mohammed Haydar Zamar, they had begun monitoring Ali al Jarrah's connections with Fatah al Islam. Robert Fisk would later write a full page article detailing the connections between Arab led militancy and the Foreign Intelligence Services in an article dated November 13, 2008. Quote At the time, the Lebanese insisted that the organization Fatah al Islam with the usual spread of Arab government from Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Algeria, had been sent into the country by Syria to cause anarchy and mayhem in the newly restored democracy of Lebanon. The group's leader, Chakar Abisi, mysteriously escaped when the battles ended, end quote. One operation he took part was involving himself with U.S. and Israeli intelligence on the monitoring of Imad Mugnia. Mugnia was the commander of Hezbollah and was assassinated on fe February 12, 2008 by U.S. and Israeli airstrikes while he was in his car. It was during after the assassination of Mugnia that Hezbollah began looking for associates who had connections to Israeli intelligence. It led them to suspect Ali al-Jara. 
The Jara family history was littered with the intelligence agency's fingerprints. However, the strange connection between the intelligence agency and the September 11th attacks doesn't end there. Another interesting anomaly involved Irving Moving Systems, a New Jersey-based company located in Weehawken who employed young Israelis on temporary work visas. In the mid-afternoon hour of September 12th, a white van matching the same description as the one that was pulled over in Pennsylvania just a day prior was again pulled over by Pennsylvania state troopers, this time in the town of York. They were pulled over and detained based on their overstate U.S. work visas, then transferred over to FBI investigators. Both men in the truck worked for Irving Moving Systems, the same company in which Eats Rutherford police officer Scott DiCarlo had detained five Israelis during the late afternoon hours of September 11th on the New Jersey Turnpike. The five Israelis were entitled the Danzig Israelis by the mainstream media, in part of them being witnessed by a woman who lived in Doric Towers in which she saw three of the men celebrating the attack of the North Tower. The two men that were pulled over in York, Roy Barak and Modi Butbul, served in the Israeli, Mitel- Israeli Mitel- military's intelligence divisions. When asked by investigators where they were going on September 12th, Roy Barak explained they were on their way to Columbus, Ohio, yet they had no actual client anywhere near there. They were pulled over on Interstate 76, which is 144 miles west of Shanksville, using the same route. Shortly after, investigators contacted Urban Moving Systems manager Dominic Souter about why they were in this part of the country. Souter could not offer an explanation, suggesting that it was strange that they were there. Souter also explained to FBI investigators that because of the prior day's events in Manhattan, the company had no clients outside the city. Barack would also claim that the FBI had suspicions about Irving Moving Systems and its obvious ties to Israeli intelligence. Quote, they asked if someone sent me to the United States. They asked me if I worked in a moving company so I could monitor these people's movements. End quote. On November 9, 2001, both Barack and Butbul were deported back to Israel for overstaying their U.S. work visas. Souter would flee back to his native Israel after FBI investigators wanted to speak with him for a second time, leaving behind an entire warehouse full of his client's furniture and belongings and a phone recorder with over 100 messages. A year later, 2020's John Miller would do an extensive report regarding the mysterious Irving Moving Systems Company, which left everything behind. Quote, three months later, 2020 cameras photographed the inside of Irving Moving Systems. It looked as if the business had been shut down in a big hurry. Cell phones were lying around. Office phones were still connected, and the property of dozens of clients remained in the warehouse. The owner had cleared out of his New Jersey home, put it up for sale, and returned with his family to Israel. End quote. It seemed not only were Jara's family with, involved with foreign intelligence, but German and Syrian intelligence assets who were also intricately involved with al-Qaeda, who were also closely monitoring and assisting members of the Hamburg cell while in Germany. Mohammed Haydar Zamar, who I mentioned previously, and Marmoon Darkanzali, both high-level al-Qaeda contacts, with Zamar being a recruiter during the Afghan civil wars in the mid-1990s. Darkanzali, a Syrian-born militant, was also quite a skilled forger and money launderer, who was also known to be one of al-Qaeda's founders, Mahmoud Mahmoud Salim, with both having a linked bank account that Darkanzali opened himself. According to a report from the Chicago Tribune in November 2002, the CIA had actively tried to recruit Darkanzali for his close ties to Al-Qaeda and the Hamburg cell. Quote, any attempt to recruit Darkanzali on behalf of the CIA would have to be made by operatives of the LFB. In early 2000, around the same time, the hijacking pilots were returning to Hamburg from Afghanistan, an LFB agent casually approached Darkanzali to ask whether he was interested in becoming a spy, end quote. Darkanzali admitted having known Atta, al Shay, and Jara as fellow worshippers at the downtown Al-Quds Mosque, where the Hamburg cell originated through the influential, fiery, Wahhabi-oriented imam, Muhammad al-Fazizi. Fazizi was also known to spout anti-Western sermons, which included his hatred for the support of Israel. 
Zamar had previously traveled to Afghanistan, where he went to many camps under the control of Al-Qaeda. While there, he trained in guerrilla tactics, his training including weapons knowledge, use of explosives, and advanced tactics. However, Zamar's connection even to Afghan warlords, some who had connection to foreign intelligence during the civil wars, which took place in Afghanistan, goes back even further. During the summer months of 1991, Zamar goes to Afghanistan and trains at an elite camp linked to Afghan warlord Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. He fights with Hekmatyar's forces, the Hizb-e-Islami, against the communist Afghan government before returning to Hamburg at the end of 1991. Hekmatyar had notable connections with British MI6, the CIA, and the Pakistan ISI. During the height of the Soviet-Afghan war, Hekmatyar received tens of millions from these agencies over the course of 10 years. In 1995, he fights in Bosnia with the Arabs against the Serbians. In 1996, Zamar goes to Afghanistan again and, pledge, and formally pledges allegiance, Bayat, to Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, according to an unnamed Arab intelligence agency. His contacts between Islamic militants and Arab criminals would continue to blossom after 1996, however, as he would make reported trips in and out of Germany. One country in particular was Syria, his native country, in which he would later renounce citizenship due to the Syrian intelligence arm, the Shuk Bat al Mukbarat, constant surveillance of his every move and pressure to talk while threatening him with arrest. He becomes an active recruiter of, poten of potential jihadis. This is where he begins to attend the Al-Quds Mosque, where he would meet many young Islamic males, including Muhammad Atta, Ramzi bin al-Shib, Saeed Baraji, Muni al Muttasek, and Marwan al shehi While Zamar attends the mosque, the German Domestic Security Agency, the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution, which is the LFE, had begun monitoring Zamar. They also had an inside informant of the Al-Quds Mosque, whose name had never been publicly released. According to a February 2, 2003 report from the German publisher Frankfurter Algemein Sontag Zintungtung, Zamar's phone calls were recorded. It was also the first time investigators learned of the full name of one of the 9-11 hijackers. The information was never shared with U.S. intelligence until after the 9-11 attacks. Quote, while being observed by the BFV, Zamar helped build the European network of Al-Qaeda. Each time when Zamar picked up the phone at home for that purpose and talked to European comrades in faith, the BFB was listening. The entire intelligence gathering repertoire was at disposal for the surveillance of Zamar, confirmed by a control committee of the Bundestag lower house of the German parliament border search, telephone tapping, observation. However, Zamar did not appear extremist, claimed at least Lind Weiler in court. In reality, Zamar would have had to lead the BFV to the suicide pilots. During the calls that the BFV tapped, Muhammad Atta's complete family name, Muhammad Atta Alamir, was mentioned twice. The BFV, however, claims that only first names were identified, never the last names. Of the second suicide pilot from Hamburg, even the phone number was registered. Al Shehi talked to Zamar twice, both times in 1999, when the planning of the attacks entered their hot phases. During both calls, Zamar asks Al Shehi if he could not come from an unknown place to Hamburg already in March 1999. End quote. Meanwhile, Zamar had helped recruit Atta Al Shehi, Munel Montesek, and Ramzi Bel Shib from the Al-Quds Mosque in Hamburg and helped transform them into the infamous Hamburg cell. Zamar had lived with them from time to time at 54 Mardingenstrasse, Hamburg, Germany. During the 28 months, Atta's name is on the apartment lease. The CIA also allegedly starts monitoring Atta in early 2000 while he is living at the apartment and does not tell Germany of the surveillance while also trying to recruit both Zamar as an informant along with Dark and Zali. Quote from The Guardian, the U.S. agents reported to have trailed Atta 
are said to have failed to inform the German authorities about their investigation, even as the Germans are investigating many of his associates. The disclosure that Atta was being trailed by police long before September 11th raises the question why the attacks could not have been, pre been prevented with the man's arrest, end quote. That article is dated September 29th, 2001. The CIA wasn't the only U.S. intelligence apparatus monitoring up Mohammed Atta. The Defense Intelligence Agency had instituted a daily mining program of their own, codenamed Able Danger. In 2005, the New York Times would break the story regarding the highly classified Able Danger program and what it unearthed between the years 1999 to 2001. The Hamburg cell that the Able Danger team were closely monitoring included future 9-11 hijackers, Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Shehi, and the Wafa Hazmi and Khalid al Midar. The New York Times would also report, quote, the account about Able Danger is the first assertion that Mr. Atta, an Egyptian, would become the lead hijacker in the plot, was identified by any American government agency as a potential threat before the September 11 attacks, end quote. Able Danger was not known until approximately the summer of 2000 as it operated under the new auspices of the U.S. Army, particularly through the U.S. Special Operations Command, or SOCOM, and the Land Information Warfare's activity, LIWA, which supports the Intelligence Security Command. Able Danger was devised as an operation which was to develop sensitive information in the transnational terrorism field, which involved the Joint Special Operations Command and the DIA. The information did not come from government databases, nor was the information classified. It was an open source collection database. The operation, however, was covert. The U.S. Army's Land Information War Warfare Activity and its Information Dominance Center used data mining techniques to link open source information along with classified information while attempting to make connections among individuals, members of terrorist organizations, to go along with human intelligence from Arab businesses and storefronts nearby known terrorist cities. Mass amounts of data were collected, including personal data from Al-Qaeda internet forums and chat rooms, as well as financial records and phone calls. Quote, using computers, the unit collects huge amounts of data in a technique called data mining. They get information from such sources as Al-Qaeda using internet chat rooms, news accounts, websites, and financial records. Using sophisticated software, they compare this with government records, such as visa applications by foreign tourists to find any correlation and depict these visually, end quote. Able danger operatives would begin imploring the FBI to begin investigations into two terror cells operating inside the United States, to which U.S. Army lawyers from SOCOM would block any such interference claiming that information used against American citizens would be unconstitutional. Zia Jara, Mohammed Atta, and Mohan al Shi having obtained temporary U.S. visas. Jara, meanwhile, had very little contact with the Hamburg cell, even though he was allegedly a member there. According to LFB investigators, there was only one instance he was ever seen together with members of the Hamburg cell, where he was a guest at Saeed Bahaji's wedding in August of 1999. That photograph would later be recovered during a search of Azel Sanguine's home, Jara's girlfriend. Attorney General John Ascroft would later make a statement at a press briefing regarding Jara living with members of the Hamburg cell to which German authorities on that same day of August, on October 23rd, 2001, responded to a reporter from the Los Angeles Times. Quote, the only information we have con connecting the three Hamburg suspects, Jara, al Shay, and Atta, is the FBI's assertion that there is a connection, said a high-ranking police source involved in the investigation, apparently unaware of the wedding photo. We have come across absolutely no evidence of our own, end quote. During the spring of 1996, Ziad Jara was in constant contact with a known Islamic militant named Abdul Rahman al Makadi, also known as Dr. K. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, 
uh, oh, Dr. K, no, he was known as something else. Jeez. And I'm forgetting his name. Oh, we'll just call him Dr. K. Jara would frequently meet with McDaddy during, during uh, this year. Jara would contact Dr. K only before an important meeting or to discuss something of great importance. Just days prior to the September 11th attack, Jara would call him. It is not definitively known what they would talk about. Al Makadi runs the local mosque and makes money by selling special Arab food he purchases in Hamburg and there. German authorities suspect he funnels his proceeds to Hamas using underground couriers. The German newspaper, Frankfurter al Jamin Zungwil, later would state about al Makdadi and Jara, quote, al Makadi is known to German security officers for officials from the Federal Office of the Protection of the Constitution, the BFB, as a Hamas activist and instigator, and that it is therefore difficult to imagine that the 26-year-old Lebanese Jara was also not registered by the machinery of the intelligence services, end quote. A year after the 9-11 attacks, a video taken from Tanak Farms, Afghanistan, in January of 2000, shows Muhammad Atta and Zia Jara together reading from a paper which transcribed from the Arabic means the will. The will was found during the military invasion of the country, and while U.S. military personnel were rummaging through the context of a farmhouse. However, the video has no sound. It is the only observable link which connects Jara to the 9-11 attacks. Jara's family, meanwhile, were left absolutely stunned regarding their young son, Ziar Jara's connection to the attacks. His father, Samir, adamantly refuses to accept the notion that his son was even a religious fanatic, exclaiming to reporters over the years that he was born into a secular household, friends with Christians and Jews, while going to a prestigious school near the beach, which was called the Mar Elias Patina. His father once proclaimed that the young affable Jara loved flying, but he forbade it. Quote, I stopped him from being a pilot, his father told the Wall Street Journal a week after the attacks. I only have one son, and I was afraid that he would crash. End quote. Zia Jara never fit the stereotypical Islamic fundamentalist, even to his former teachers in Lebanon a student from Greasewald University, where Ziad Jara studied area space engineering. Abdullah al makadi said of Jara's portrayal of being a Muslim while, in, while living with his girlfriend, quote, I used to criticize him for living with her. By our religion, this living together before marriage is not allowed. He was a weak Muslim, I must say, end quote. Personnel at the flight school Jara attended at the Florida Flight Training Center were in complete disbelief. They also described him as a normal person, loved by most at the school. Nothing at all seemed to fit the FBI in the 9-11 Commission's narrative regarding Zia Jara as a Muslim fanatic. While the anomalies surrounding Flight 93 and the hijackers continued to eliminate a more alarming narrative, one that involves the domestic intelligence arm, the CIA, and foreign intelligence from Israel, Germany, and Syria, and their involvement with the hijackers here and abroad over the previous years. The deeper understanding regarding the intelligence apparatuses and their intricate role of the September 11th attacks, however, will go completely unnoticed and in most cases, willfully unignored. The reason? The inability for most within the truth movements to even accept the basics of what happened on September 11, 2001 as a remote possibility. Instead, some of these people in the truth movements who are the fringe conspiracists, unreservingly willing to believe the fantastical and the outrageous, and in some cases, the irrational, purported by profiteering antagonists who purport speculation as a form of evidence. And thus, that is the problem with the fringe conspiracists who have hijacked the truth movement and those of the federal government who told a narrative that omitted the information that I just portrayed here in this podcast. In between these two is the truth. And there's more truth to be told. And we need to tell it responsibly. It is our mission. Mission that involves the truth. To be eludicated 
to the general public without prejudice and without bias. That ends this episode of The Dark and Dower. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. <laughs>